this. This is what's called a stub network. This stub network is a couple of devices and there's only one way out and one way in to this particular network. Well, why go through any dynamic routing protocol? Why go through all that headache when all you have to do in this stub network is say, hey, send everything that way. And all you have to do over here is say, hey, if you want to get to 172.16.1, send it this way. Static routes can totally do the job in an environment like this. Yeah. Static routes can do the job for you. Let's take a look at something here. Let's, let me show you how to statically route, okay? All right, and then we'll take our break because I know you're ready for a break. Okay, so let's look at R2, show IP interface brief, okay? We look at R2 and we've got fast ethernet zero slash zero that's connected to the 192.168.1 network. And then we've got that 10.10.10 network that we did in our simulated WAN. Okay, well, sure enough, if we go over to R3, R3 is in the 192.168 network and it tries to communicate with the WAN network, R1, it can't. Now, why can't it? Well, look at its routing table. Do a show IP route. It can't communicate with the 10.10.10 network because it has no idea where to send that traffic. It didn't even try. It looked in its routing table and it said, sorry, Charlie, I have absolutely no idea where to send that traffic. The only thing I know about is 192.168.10. Okay, so let's give it a static route. Ready? IP route in global configuration mode. And we'll say, look, to get to the 101010 10, 10 network, go ahead and send your traffic to your neighbor at 192.168.1.2. You could also do it this way, by the way. You could say, just send your network out FA0 slash zero. Just send your traffic out the interface. But specifying the next hop is much more efficient. Yeah, you're telling it literally to send it to the following IP. It's more efficient. Wow. Now let's look at the routing table. Show IP route. Aha. Uh -huh. And there's our static route in there telling R3 what to do with that traffic. Now you do this and you're all excited and you rerun your ping test and it fails. And this is when you get very depressed and you say, you know what? None of this works. Anthony taught me this stuff and it doesn't work. Well, always remember this. This device now knows how to get to the 10, 10, 10 network, but does the device in the 10, 10, 10 network know how to get back? Remember, these communications are two-way streets. Never forget that. So if you go over to R1 and look at its routing table, you see your problem. It has no way to know to get back to 192168. Now, we're going to do a clever static route here called a default static route. You ready? 
we're going to say to get to anything, I don't care what it is, send your traffic to R2 at 10, 10, 10, 2. This is called a default static route. This is so cool. I don't care what it is, send it to R2. Look at how this shows up in the routing table. It shows up with an asterisk. And it says that we now have a gateway of last resort. This sounds like something out of a Stephen King novel. <laughs> Specifically, The Shining. So, now this device has somewhere to send any traffic it doesn't know how to route. And now that these two networks know how to reach each other, our ping works perfectly. We have now provided connectivity in this network thanks to static routes. Let me recap for you what we just did. We have R1 connected via a serial to R2 connected via a LAN to R3. Here's the 10 network. Here's the 192 network. We put a static route right here telling R3 how to get to the 10 network. And then we put a static default over here telling R1 to send everything to R2. R2, we didn't have to do anything at all because it's connected to both networks. R2 has full knowledge of both networks.